sometimes when I art journal, I'm art journaling about feelings and about, you know, stuff, head noise and, you know, crazy stuff that you got to, I got to get out and get on the page and, you know, just put it somewhere else. Other times I art journal just because I want to see how certain paints work or inks or, you know, I just want to see how stuff works. I want to see how things work if I put them together before I go to a canvas or, you know, to do something that is, um, you know, something I really care about. Not that I don't care about my art journals, but my art journals are a place where I really do a lot of experimentation. So in this class, we're going to experiment with a new paint. It's not real new, but it's been out in the last, just come out in the last few months called Distress Paint. So that's what we're going to do in today's class. So let's get started. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you about some supplies. And of course, you're going to need to have something to do your process on to do your pages on and so this is the 300 series Strathmore mixed media journal and the size is 5.5 by 8.5 so it's not a, a big journal it's a nice size to experiment with what I want to show you about this is that on this particular one I've taken the spiral off so this had a spiral binding just like this and I've taken that off, I've removed it just simply by opening, carefully opening the little rings. Not very much, just enough that I could carefully take it off and de-spiral my journal. And then I marked it with a piece of tape. Then it just says on the tape, it's a Strathmore Mixed Media 90 pound journal. Just because sometimes when they punch these holes, they're done with a specific machine and sometimes you need to have <clears throat> a reference as to which thing it goes with and also you want to know that that um, you don't want to throw it away okay you don't want to throw that spiral away in case you want to put it back on when you're finished now to hold the journal together I just use these rings that are um, rings that clip together that you can get in the office supply store they're easy to use super easy to use and you can just Put them in there, thread it through the holes. See how easy it is? <laughs> just kidding. And they just clip together. So they're um, easy to use and they'll hold your journal. And that way, the advantage is if you like doing things this way, which sometimes I do, I have to say, I like not working around the spiral. Now, this was another journal page that we did in another. Um, another class working with gelatos and so forth and you can see how in here although I worked around the spirals with my brush there's still some places that some of the gelato didn't get all the way over there so an advantage to working with your journal this way is if you want to you can get your your paint or your whatever you're working with clear into the spirals if you like if that's important to you so that is one of the, the um, things that some people like to do. Honestly, I don't always take them apart, but I thought, well, you know, it's just another thing I can show you. So just de-spiral your journal if you wish, and um, if you have one like that, and then you're good to go. Okay, so that covers your journal. So let's talk about some of the adhesives that we're going to use. This one is a Scotch Quick Dry Adhesive, so I'm going to be using that one. I'm also going to be using the ArtQuest Perfect Paper Adhesive. I'm going to use it in matte, and I'm going to use both of these. Glues are one of those things that you got to have lots of, lots of different, because they work for different specific purposes. So um, there's not one glue that works for everything, unfortunately. <laughs> so get yourself some glues, an assortment of glues. We're also going to use a product called wood icing, and this is a texture paste and paste. And this is in it comes in a quart container. You can also get it in smaller containers. But what I do is I just had a um, jar that had some moisturizer or something in it that was empty, and so I just transfer it 
you know, into a smaller container so that I don't have to open and close this, this big thing all the time. And that is much easier for me to use. So I would recommend you do the same thing if you get wood icing. If you fall in love with this technique and you want to use it, I love wood icing. You can also use, um, you can also use modeling paste. The light modeling paste is good for doing some, you know, the same kind of thing we're doing today. But I just thought I would show you about wood icing because it's really a nice product. This is acrylic gesso, and a gesso, it doesn't matter what brand you use, gesso is a primer and it will prime and kind of um, prepare your page. So sometimes I use it, sometimes I don't. I probably use it more times than I don't use it. But it kind of primes and thickens the paper a little bit, keeps stuff from absorbing through it, and so I use that. You're also going to need a palette knife of some kind. <clears throat> this is a little plastic, <clears throat> pardon me. I use a little plastic palette knife, and this is for spreading the wood icing on your page. And um, I like the plastic ones. They're easy to work with, and when you're finished with them, and if, you know, if it breaks or something, you haven't invested a lot of money, and you can throw it out if you need to. And a brush, just this is about three quarters of an inch to one inch across. This is just an inexpensive brush. I do take care, I don't buy expensive brushes, and I do take care of them for a really long time, and then when they get too cruddy, like it's got some stuff on the metal part here when it gets too cruddy it becomes a glue brush and then it just eventually goes away all right these I'll show you these right here these are the distress paints that we're going to work with and the person that formulated these paints is uh, tim holtz he's formulated a lot of products that are people use in the mixed media world and these are the colors that we're going to be using. I'm put the black and the white over here so you can kind of see. This is Distress Paint. This color is Black Soot. This color is Picket Fence. This one is Peeled Paint. And I'm going to be using all of these colors today. This one is Bundled Sage. This one is Rusty Hinge. This one is Mustard Seed and this one is Broken China. So I'm going to be using all of those, each of these paints. I think these come, this is a fairly good size line of colors now, and uh, they're very interesting paints to work with. They're not quite like your other acrylic paints, so that's why we're going to play around with those today, because I want to show you, you know, kind of what I've discovered with them and so forth. Another thing you're going to be using is a couple of different kinds of pens. And so I'm going to be using the Jelly Roll Black Medium Point, which is the way it comes. It's a medium point black Jelly Roll pen by the company Sakura. And I'm going to be using the Faber-Castell Pit Artist Pen. This one tends to be quite shiny, which is fun to use. And this one, this Pit Artist Pen, is... Um, is a matte finish and this is a permanent pen that you can go over with stuff. This one sometimes will dissolve under wet other wet media. <clears throat> so you kind of have to be a little careful with what you put over the top of it. But it's still fun to use. All right, I'm also going to use <clears throat> a napkin. This is just a paper napkin that I bought at a we have a store here that sells a lot of um, products, especially paper napkins and stuff, at a really reasonable price. And so I always scope out their napkins. So this is, because honestly, these napkins, these napkins are worthless when it comes to using them as a napkin, but they are wonderful as an art supply. <laughs> so, so I recommend that you don't waste your time trying to wipe your face on them because they don't absorb anything. But they are perfect for art supplies. And what you want is something that has a number of the same image in it. And so in this case, I'm going to work with the roses. So that's what I'm using, what I'm looking for in this. And they may not all be roses, but they're, they're reasonably close renditions of roses. If not, anyway. My dad was the one who was the, the uh, flower person, not me. <laughs> okay. 
So this is a uh, paper napkin. Now let me tell you a little bit about paper napkins, just so you know. Paper napkins come with plies of paper. And if you look at this, and you'll have to use a pen or a pokey tool, or if you have fingernails, you can use that. But you can see that this backing separates from it pretty easily. Now, here's the thing. There's usually, usually, sometimes you have to split the napkin, tear it a little bit, and look to see if, in fact, there is another ply because most of the time these paper napkins are three ply. And this one is, if I can get it to come apart so you can really see, there we go. So can you see how very, it's almost a gossamer layer. It's very thin, this top layer. And that's all we're gonna be working with is the top layer. So these other two layers back here need to be discarded or, or you can stick them in with your paper towels. They really don't absorb very much, so I usually just toss them, you know. You're going to need a pair of scissors, just paper scissors. So paper scissors goes with your napkin. I want you to uh, think about using some text paper. This is just paper that I ripped out of some old books. Um, correlation and regression analysis. What better way, or volition, what better way to use this than in artwork, right? <laughs> now you can see that I've already painted it, but we'll do that in a little bit. A craft scrubby is really a good thing to have to clean up your hands when it's all over with. Of course, you're going to need some water. And um, then I would get, um, always have a date stamp so you can stamp your pages with the date when you're finished because you really will be glad you did down the road that you've tracked when you did the various pages and what was going on and so forth and you probably will want to have some paper towels paper towels are a really good thing to have in your studio and you might also consider having baby wipes very good and another thing I have are some little cups like this. Actually, I get these from when we order pizza occasionally. And cheese, Parmesan cheese comes in these, and I save them. They have nifty little, little lids that come on them too, and so you can store little bits and stuff, bits and pieces of things. If you happen to hear a mournful, pitiful meow going on in the background, it's because there's a cat. There's actually two cats. They live right back here behind this door <laughs> when, when I'm recording classes for you. That's where they go, and they're not happy about it. So sometimes you might hear the little mournful meow. They're Siamese cats, so they're quite mournful, in, and they sound like they're being tortured and abused. But let me tell you, there is nothing that tortures nor abuses those cats. <laughs> nothing. All right, enough, enough drivel. Let's get going. So the first thing we're going to do is I'm going to take these pages or take my rings out of my journal and I'm going to get a couple of pages, get a couple of pages ready to work on. All right, so I'm just going to open it up and I'm just going to pull out a couple of pages just like this because I'm going to do what's called a two-page spread on, um, on my surface. Two-page spread, which means I'm going to do the whole page is going to span both, uh, the whole subject matter is going to span two pages, hence the word, the name, two-page spread. All right, so here is my spread, and I'm going to now use um, the wood icing. Get this where you can see it. So we're going to use the wood icing, the first thing. And so remember, I transferred my wood icing down to this little container, and it kind of looks like peanut butter or putty. It's kind of what it looks like. And I'm going to use my palette knife, and I'm just going to get some of this. It, it looks a lot like the consistency of it when it's um, fresh, which as it, as it dries, it begins to thicken 
uh, but when it's fresh, it has a very peanut butter-like consistency. So all I'm going to do is just put a thin coat of this on, just kind of hit and miss. The whole purpose of this is just simply to create some texture. Now, I don't cover the whole page, and I make it as thin an application as possible. If you don't have a palette knife, you could always use a credit card or an old hotel room key. Um, but it's just something that spreads this nice and thin. You can get to the edges if you want, or you don't have to. And I generally don't put it into the spiral area. I generally kind of leave that alone. And it's okay if you have some texture, leave some um, chunky spots in it. It just takes longer if you do for that to dry. So most of the time, especially when I'm uh, creating a class, I go pretty thinly with the application. Spread it pretty thinly nice thin coat because it dries so fast and then you can keep moving and that is the great part about this product is it dries so fast and you know in everything there is a good news and the bad news the good news is it dries so fast the bad news is it dries so fast so sometimes you may find yourself frustrated by a product and that's because you're trying to push the limits but guess what when you're trying to push the limit you're trying to figure out what it will do that's the whole purpose of some kinds of art journaling all right so good enough so just make sure make sure that you cap your wood icing whether it's in a jar like this whether you've got it in something small, or if you're using out of the big container, no matter whether it's wood icing or modeling paste or whatever you're working with, any kind of texture stuff dries, and that's what it's supposed to do. But you gotta make sure that you squash the air out of this, so when you push this lid back down, push, you know, to try and displace the air, and use a hammer, and make sure that you hammer this down all the way evenly all the way around don't let any gaps form there so that you have that um, really even um, pressure on the lid and that is pretty much going to assure you that you've got the um, got the lid on there straight and as much of the air out of it as possible now another thing that I do with the wood icing, you want to take it off your tools as soon as you can because it does dry. So you can use it through stencils as well, which is great, but you kind of want to make sure that you have some water available that you can stick your, uh, drop your tools or your stencils down into because if you don't, the wood icing will dry and uh, it's, it's stuck pretty tightly. So. That's what we use our palette knife and our wood icing for. And it just spreads on here and then it's going to dry. Now I don't think I told you earlier that you're gonna need a heat gun, but it's a really good idea to have a heat gun if you're trying to force this dry, which of course is what we're trying to do since we're doing a class. So this is a heat it uh, craft tool by the Ranger Company. And I'm going to heat this pretty quickly. Like I said, it dries really fast. And one of the things that's nice about working on the paper when it's out of the book is you can turn it over easily and you can heat it from the back side, which just further encourages your um, wood icing to get dry for you. But if it's a very thin coat, and it does dry pretty quickly. The nice thing about the Ranger Heat It tool, there are lots of different heat guns on the market, and I've tried several of them. The nice thing about this particular one is not only is it really quiet, but it doesn't 
it doesn't uh, put out a lot of air so it doesn't tend to blow your what you're working on you know if you have papers magazine images or collage papers or what have you around on your work surface it doesn't tend to blow them away and that's nice because um, the other ones I mean everything has its place right um, but some of the other ones get a little a little forceful with their airflow now what I usually do is go back over it with my fingers and I just rub it with some pressure and that way if I have any uh, chunks of wood icing that are on the surface I just kind of sand them down with my fingers a little bit so although it's you know you are after texture I'm not after globs and big you know chunks of wood icing that stand up on the surface of my paper all right so that is there are the two pieces of my journal page my two spreads so you can see and get the idea of how much um, I've smeared it and you know it's kind of chunk chunk kind of chunky looking but it does have if you could feel it you feel there is a little texture in the surface that's all you're after some texture okay the next thing we're gonna do is I'm gonna follow my notes so I know exactly so I tell you the same steps that I that I figured for this class. The next thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna get a little bit of water in my icky water container. Because I like to usually work with a damp brush for most things. I find it works better. And a paper towel. A couple paper towels. I usually have these in my lap so that um, I always have something to sop up a mess if I make it accidentally. Okay, so the gesso. Now, this particular, most gessos, if you can shake it a little bit, it'll help to kind of mix the paint up a little bit. And then I often will just work out of the lid. And then when I use that up, I'll dip into the, the actual jar of gesso. Okay, damp brush. Pick up your gesso and paint it right over your wood icing. And I usually go right over the rings where the rings were. <clears throat> if the rings were still in here, I would be poking the brush in around those rings, which works fine. It's just easier if, uh, for the purposes of demonstration, if you just simply despiral that. And like I said, some people really don't want to work around that spiral. So this is a fairly new bottle of gesso, so it is pretty. Um, it's kind of the consistency of a thicker craft paint, and it's a nice consistency. But if it was too thick because as air gets into the container whether it's gesso or the wood icing it will start thickening things um, I would maybe add a little bit more water but you can see I just put a coat of gesso over that we'll do the same thing on the other one maybe pick up just a teeny bit more water just to help it to move and that's that's what it does is it thins the paint just enough thins the gesso just enough that it will let that paint move and glide across the surface a little bit more. Can you hear that pathetic cat in there? His name, the one that is meowing, is named Chance. And he is feeling very, very put upon. Sometimes he actually bangs himself against the door because he uh, is feeling so lonely and so left out. All right, so here is our other page. Gesso, now you can see the light shining on it, and once, once that stops, once you don't see light shining on it anymore, then you know the gesso is dry. So you can see on this one, there is no light shining on it. 
Um, now the other test for whether something is dry, an acrylic thing, is to feel it. If it feels cool to the touch, it's not dry. And this is still a little bit cool. So we're going to let that sit for a minute while I clean up my brush and put the gesso away. And I'm working on a non-stick craft mat that I have taped to a board. And so the reason I tape it down is, first of all, it makes it portable. And secondly, um, it keeps it nice and flat because the craft mats, unless you tape them down, they tend to want to curl up on you and make you a little crazy. And you know what? I'm not about being crazy. I've been accused of being crazy. <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> yes, haven't we all? But, you know, I don't need my art supplies to cause me any, any issues. So that was a baby wipe that I used, and it's just going to pick up that excess gesso so we don't need to use it. And you can see how it just all comes off. Now it's on my hands. Yep, sure is. So when I'm all done for the day, I'll use the craft scrubby and some liquid soap and I will clean up my hands. And that thing works like a dream. It gets gesso and glue and all kinds of stuff off your hands. All right, let's go back to the heat gun and dry, dry our pages, dry our gesso. Now this one on the, the left that I did first, it's pretty dry but it's still a little cool to the touch, so we'll give it some heat. And you'll notice on um, your paper, whether it's watercolor paper or this is mixed media paper, you'll notice that as it gets wet, it will start to usually do some buckling and some curling and doing some weird stuff. See how it's curling up? And that happens as it's drying. It'll go through that process, and then usually it'll flatten itself back down as it gets completely dry. But you just sort of have to work with it, work with the paper, and realize that paper has grain, paper has memory. I think paper has an opinion of its own, quite honestly. Now you can see how that's flattened out and sort of curled back this direction. So you can work back and forth until it is fully dry and then it will uh, it'll be pretty flat when it's fully dry. So I'll do the same thing on this one. The big thing is feel it with your hand and if it's really cool to the touch that it's not dry enough. So. You don't want to see any shine left, and you also don't want to feel any real cool temperature left in the... So that's nice and warm now. We'll hit it just one more time, just for good measure. Like so. So it does take a few minutes. Now, if I was doing this and not filming a class, I would put the gesso on and, and walk away and just let it do its thing. The other thing you can do too, when I'm art journaling, a lot of times I'll have more than one journal going and I will work on one and set it to the side while something dries and work on another one. Just do something else in another one. And that way you've got things in process and in stages. Okay, let's take a look at this so you can see what, what we have going on here texture-wise. So there is, you can see the texture of the wood icing. That's the tan looking um, substance down there. So that's the wood icing. Wood icing does have a little color to it. If you would prefer to work with something that has no color, you want to work with light modeling paste, which is white. 
and you can also mix paint into the light modeling paste which is kind of a cool thing to do too to actually color it and do things but we're using it for texture so the color doesn't matter all right so there is the the wood icing and on top of it is gesso all right so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put some paint on it now the paints i'm using uh for this i'm going to use four colors and I'm going to use the bundled sage, the um, rusty hinge, the mustard seed, and the broken china. All right. Now, these paints, I think you can hear there's a little mixing ball in the bottom of these. And I will tell you, here's the thing I have had the hardest thing remembering about working with these little paints. And they're not very big bottles. Uh, but they are highly pigmented and they go a long way. The thing I have the hardest time remembering is to shake them, really shake them up before I use them. I don't know why that is so hard for me to remember, but anyway. So I shake them all up. And then I'm ready to go. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the yellow, the mustard seed. And these have a valve in the end that has a little dabber end, a little dauber, dabber, whatever it's called. And I usually start that on my craft mat. So I just get it started. Once it's started, then I just start applying the paint on my mat or on my paper. I'll give you a little better look at what I'm doing here. Okay, here we go. Now, this is this is purely random. And you can kind of squeeze the bottle a little bit or you can hit it again on your um, craft mat over here to make sure that you've got the paint. Or you can just dab it and then, um, then spread it out with the top. You can also dip a brush into these paints and paint with a brush out of the bottle. doesn't matter. It's totally your call. Okay, so there's our yellow. And then I'm going to go to the bundled sage. Same thing. I'm going to start the paint over here on the mat. And I'm just, there is not a lot of thought as to what I'm doing here, except I'm just getting paint out onto the gessoed wood icing surface. Okay, we'll go to Broken China next. Again, I'm just picking these up in random order. It doesn't really matter. And it doesn't matter if they get into each other a little bit and start changing colors slightly. That's okay with me. because we're gonna mix them together anyway. Okay, so we got some broken china, and then we're gonna finish up whatever the space that we have left, I'm gonna fill in with a rusty hinge, and if it seems like it's getting to be too much, I'll go back and add some other colors in here if I left too much room, which perhaps I have. But you do want to just kind of cover your page with your um, paints, the distress paints. Now the thing that makes these paints different than other paints is that they um, take longer to dry than your typical acrylic paint. I'm going to go back to the bundled sage. And I'm going to add a little bit more bundled sage in here across the top just to kind of fill in just because it felt that way, you know. Sometimes you just go, in fact, most of the time when I'm art journaling, I'm going by the feel of the thing. All right, now you can uh, do a couple of different things. You can blend this with a baby wipe or you can blend it with a damp brush. I'm going to use the damp brush. So I've rinsed out my brush from my gesso 
and I'm just going to blend back and forth. I'm using quite a bit of pressure and I'm going to blend the colors together. And what I'm after is just, I'm just going to get kind of a watercolor look, you know, kind of a Monet watercolorish kind of look about it. Kind of pastel, kind of, let's see it there. Okay. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other page. So, and I don't waste a lot of time doing this. I get in there and do it, even though the paints take a little bit longer to dry. They are drying and because they are acrylic. And so you do want to get in there and, and mix them together. Now, if you don't get enough, if you don't get them mixed fast enough and they dry too much, you can always go back in and add a little bit more paint. And we're going to call that pretty good. You can always add more, as I said, if you need it. Okay, so here is, there's our two pages, okay? Now, one of the cool things about this paint is that until it is fully dry, it will reactivate or it will react to water. So I'm gonna take my paintbrush and I'm going to literally hit it against my hand and I am sprinkling water on the surface of this page, right on top of the semi-dry, but not fully dry paint. So it's semi-dry. So I've got droplets of water. You can see them shining in the light. So there's drops of water. It's totally random, completely random, and it's just gonna react with the water here for a minute. And so I wait, oh, maybe 30 seconds to a minute. And, um, and then I'm going to take my brush or my uh, paper towel, wadded up paper towel. And I'm going to dab. And keep turning your paper towel so you don't just transfer the paint. But what you're going to see is that the water has, acti has reacted with the paint. Now regular craft paints don't do this and that's what makes these so interesting and it will actually pick up the paint and spots the paint and gives you this really cool background. Again it adds more texture. This time it's visual texture instead of texture with um, a texture paste like the wood icing. So you can see how by dabbing it, I've dabbed up and created spots in the paint. Keep turning your paper towel. And if that's not enough, which it usually isn't for me, I come back in and I will add some more. Some of the colors are... Um, more highly pigmented, like that mustard seed is a really, really bright yellow. So sometimes I like to give it, you know, give it a second shot of the water droplets so that I can, you know, get a little bit more texture, look of texture in that paint. So again, 30 seconds to a minute, just let it sit there. It works its magic. <clears throat> and the water out of the way so we don't spill that and then just come in with your paper towel and dab and this works until you can reactivate that paint until it is dry and once it is completely dry there is no more pulling paint up like this so you can see in here in this section you can see the spots in the yellow, but they're more they're not white like these are. That's because the paint had begun to dry beneath um, the spots of water. 
so you get an even more interesting look because now I have two shades of yellow as well as the white splots from uh, the water in the, the um, initial paint that was still wetter. All right. So that is one of the cool things about distress paints that until they are fully dry, they will react. And so you can get some really interesting effects with your um, doing water or any other kind of wet stuff will react with this paint. But the other beautiful thing about distress paints is once they are fully dry, they will not react and they will not move and they are permanent on your page. So that is the other beautiful thing about them. But you have to just play with them and get them uh, to be at their best. So that means that use them for what they're intended for. Uh, don't, don't expect them to do things that they're not capable of doing. But this, I mean, this is, I have to say, I love the colors and I do love what they, what they do. So that is very cool. All right. So the next thing we're going to do while this is drying is we're going to take our um, napkin, our paper napkin, and we're going to look for images in this paper napkin. And like I said, I'm going to use the, the roses. And so I'm going to just use my little paper scissors. And I usually do this when all the layers are intact and then I separate them. So I just come in here and I just sort of roughly cut out the rose, the rose shape that I'm going to use here. So I just cut it out roughly like this. So here is my roughly cut shape. And then I'm going to come in here and I'm going to fussy cut, which means that I'm going to cut the edges right around the edges. Sometimes I tear paper napkin because I like the feathery edges. But for doing this one, I decided that I wanted to have the, the real smooth outline of the rose petals. So I'm just coming around and you move when to, to really fussy cut something out, whether it's fabric or paper, move the item and not your scissors. Kind of keep your scissors kind of steady. So you can see my scissors aren't moving, but this is moving. And so I'm just moving it around as I cut with the scissor blades. And you'll get a better, instead of trying to do this with your scissors, that just makes for all kinds of jagged cuts. You can get a much smoother cut if you'll do it that way. So here is our little, here's our little rose cut out. Okay, so there's one of the roses. And then I use your use um, the Ranger pokey tool or use a pin or use something to separate the back two layers. And I got them all in one shot here. There's two, see, two layers of backing paper, which I'll throw out. And by the way, if you have um, if you have trouble separating the layers of things like this where they just are really, truly stuck together. Um, a friend of mine taught me this trick. Take this and huff on it like this. <sighs> and the warm breath, the warm, moist breath from your mouth will allow those layers to separate a lot easier. And I have no idea why that works, um, but it does. And so if you have fingernails, which I really don't have, too many years of playing the piano, it will separate those layers much more easily for you. So huff on your napkins and they'll separate. That's a good trick. That's a good trick. All right, now here's what happens. Here's what happens after you cut out your napkin, after you cut your roses out. <laughs> yes, Swiss cheese occurs in your napkin. 
So, but there's still lots of images left here. So there's no reason to throw that away. So just save your images and you can use them in a future project. So what I've done here is I've cut all my little roses out. So I cut them all out in my, from my napkin. And here is one, here is, these are not the same image, but they're very similar. <coughs> Pardon me, <coughs> froggy throat at the moment. This one has been separated from the backing. This one has not. You can see the color is much more intense with the white behind it. Um, so, <coughs> so to keep your, um, to keep the colors very intense, if you wanted that, they would need to go down on a white background. If, because you can see how clear that is, but we're not interested in that for this particular journal page because it's all about the distress paints. Remember, it's all about the distress paints. So we're gonna use our distress journal background, distress paint background that we have. And I'm going to now add my roses, my rose images onto my journal pages. Okay, so that's what's going to go on here. So I'm just going to make a flower garden using my roses. And the reason I have these clipped together with a clothespin is because it just is easy to handle and it keeps them from flying away <laughs> because they do want to fly away um, because they're so lightweight. So we'll see how well we do here. So I just simply start placing my roses and I'm going to let some of them hang off the page. I'm going to place them at different angles. And I'm just going to let some of them, I'm going to um, sort of use the, the different colors. And one of the things that I want to do is I want to have one, at least one, that's going to straddle the two pages because that's going to tie my pages together. And the other thing that I do when I'm doing something like this is um, I'm going to have to turn my ceiling fan off. Hang on just a second. <clears throat> my ceiling fan is blowing my napkins around and that's a bad thing. Another thing that you want to do is I would recommend an odd number of images in total. So I just place them around and I kind of let them go upward like so. Have an upward feeling because I want these two pages to have a cohesive feel but I want them to kind of have a direction, have some movement in the page. So let's see how many we have. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But if I put these two together, that can actually kind of look like one, or I can actually add another rose down here and separate these a little bit. I mean, you just literally um, do them as you wish. And that one's a little too big, so we might put it you might put this one coming off the page and this one coming down here into the, the um, closer to the bottom. So eight, and we'll just put this other little one right here. All right, and so if you have some left over, you have some left over. That's a good thing too. So I'm just going to clip these together and save those for something in the future. And to put these down, I'm going to use the Perfect Paper Adhesive. And I always shake it up a little bit. And I find it easiest to put this in a little container, a little separate container. And your lids like this, if you have lids on glues, whether it's this or gesso or any kind of glue, if you have trouble getting these lids off and on, what I use is Vaseline and I put it around the threads in here. I put it around the threads of the opening of the, the um, jar or bottle. And it is amazing 
how, what that will do. Now periodically you do have to reapply it, but it's amazing how much that really helps your um, bottles or jar lids to get them off and on. All right, so same brush. I'm using exactly the same brush, I, brush I've been using. And this is the perfect paper adhesive that I'm using, as I said. Let's see if I can give you a real close up. Look at what I'm gonna be doing. Okay, so here is my, there's my rose garden on my page. And now what you do is take this adhesive and just start someplace. We'll start over here because it's closest to me. And I just pick up the image and I put down the adhesive and then I lay the image into it. And because the Perfect Paper Adhesive is not sticky, which I don't understand exactly what, how you can have a glue that's not sticky, but it's not, it will allow you to put this down completely flat. And if you needed to actually lift this up again, which I did, it, you can lift it up and put it back down. And this delicate paper napkin, single layer paper napkin doesn't tear. I, I, it's, it's an amazing, amazing product. So I put the perfect paper adhesive down and then I just drop the rose into it, drop the image into it, and then smooth it from the center out. So just make sure that you have completely covered your image in the perfect paper adhesive. You can see I'm being a little careful. And you can get this down, this gossamer thin coat or layer of napkin will go down perfectly flat which I'm going to tell you I I have worked with a lot of different kinds of uh, collage materials different kinds of glues and I find that this is a really and truly amazing for things that are really thin like the paper napkin and also things like tissue paper works really well for that. Okay, so we're going to put this, this straddling these two pages right here. So this is going to get tricky for a minute. Which is kind of fun to have something tricky to do, you know? But what you'll see now, because this is so thin, and I'll go back and cut these two pages apart here in just a minute. Because this is so thin, it will allow those distress paints from the background to show through. And it colors these napkin images And it almost, if you know what a piece rose is, it almost has that illusion of a piece rose. If you drop a little glue, just soak it up. It's matte in finish, so it will blend with the matte finish of the paints. And one more. Always let something hang off or a couple of somethings hang off your page. Always, always. Okay. Now, we're all finished with that and I came out about even with my adhesive, so I'm not going to worry about trying to save that and put it back in the bottle. But if I had much left in the little cup, I would put it back in my bottle of adhesive and I would save it because I am I don't like to waste things. All right, so I'm going to come in here and I might be able to do this without scissors. Let's see. Yeah, it's just going to pull apart for me. And this pulled off the edge, which is great. And these over on this edge, I'm just going to slip 
behind to the other side. And I'm going to use a little bit of the adhesive and just glue those down on the other side. Sometimes that's an unexpected fun little surprise when you turn over your page then the next time when you're going to work with it and you've got something on the other side already started for you. Now the places where I have holes right here and here, when this is fully dried, then I'll just open those holes back up to uh, be able to put my rings back in. Okay, so now here is, here's our page with our distress paint background and our rose garden is growing. But I will tell you, there is no way to get that perfectly flat application of those tiny or that gossamer thin layer of paper napkin any other way than to use that perfect paper adhesive. You can do it with other glues, but you're not going to get the same result. Okay. All right. So I'm going to let this sit for a moment. It's going to dry pretty quickly, which is cool that it's going to do that. So I'm just going to set those off to the side and we're going to talk about this. And this is text paper. And text paper is just, like I said, old paper from old books. And what I did to prepare these is I took two colors of the Distress Paints. I used the Bundled Sage, which is this light, beautiful light green. And I used Peeled Paint. And again, shake them up. And then just simply paint your text paper. Just paint across the paper. Not trying to blend them very well. You're just after, you know, some streaky look. And I let them go vertically on purpose because this is going to become my stems. Then you're going to just either let them air dry, which is what I did on this. And it kind of, you can see the paper's kind of buckly, which won't hurt anything. You can let them dry on their own or you can force it dry using your heat gun. So either way. Okay, make sure we don't have any adhesive on our surface here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut some stems. And I'm just going to randomly cut stems out of this text paper. And I'm going to make some of them kind of straight and some of them kind of curly. But I'm after the, um, the greenest part of my paper. So I'm not going to use this because it doesn't have much on it. I mean, I could get a little out of there, but I really want to have the, if I'm going to use text paper, I want to have the words visible. So I use that. And I'll just do different sizes, different thicknesses, because I have different sizes of roses. And of course you want a stem for each rose. Now, I'm probably not going to completely do every little thing on both of these pages, otherwise you'd be here all day. We don't want to do that. And I have this one, which has got some lighter shades of green on it. So I'm going to do a couple stems out of this one. So this is where you just get your, get your scissors going and just don't it, resist the, the urge to draw your stems. Try not to do that. Now, obviously, you're not going to know if you get your pencil out there and you draw some stems because you're more comfortable cutting on a line. But just for fun, just see if you can. Make yourself just get it, get it going and just be spontaneous. Now, the other thing you want to do with this same paper, so I've got a bunch of stems here. They're going to just sit over here to the side. Is I want to cut leaves. Now, to cut leaves, again, I do not draw these. I just start randomly cutting. Now the shape that I'm going to draw, I'll draw one just so you can see kind of the shape I'm going for. That's kind of the shape. 
okay? It's just a plain little leaf shape. My dad was a uh, um, professor of the subject floriculture at the university where he taught. And he was very meticulous about how things were shaped. Okay, as I just said a few minutes ago, he was the professor, I am not. So I do it the way I want to do it. <laughs> so these are not going to be your real leaf shapes for real roses. These are Barb's rendition of leaf shapes for roses. Now what you're after is to get a variety of colors, so try to get some of these that are the more grassy green color um, and some of them that are the more kind of mint green color. Let's see if I can show those to you. So this one has more of the kind of darker green. This one is more lighter. More lighter. Listen to that. <coughs> lighter in color. And then, of course, I like to vary the shape and size, so I'll come in and I'll do some little bitty guys. All right, so just sit down and just cut yourself a whole bunch of leaves like that. So you got a bunch of stems to choose from, and you got a bunch of leaves to choose from. And then I just drop them into this little cup. So these are all different sizes and shapes and colors of leaves. So you can just stick them all in there. That'll have your little container of uh, leaves all ready for you. So we got stems and leaves, okay? Now let's go back to our page here for a minute. And I'm going to hit this with a heat gun just a little bit because it's not quite dry. It's close, but it's not quite dry. So let's come back and let's dry them a little bit more. I try to keep these classes to about an hour, hour and a half a piece. This one may run a little bit longer because there's a lot to show you on this journal page. It's a little tricky to do journal pages very quickly. And so you may need to pause the video and go get yourself something to drink or take a break and come back and finish up watching the page develop in the class. Certainly feel free to do that. But it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where you, I really don't want to leave out steps. And I probably won't complete both of these pages, but I have one finished to show you what it looks like. And of course they never come out the same, even though you try, try, try to have them come out the same, they never come out exactly the same. Okay, those are pretty good, pretty good shape. All right, before we go to the stems and leaves, I wanna show you a little bit about just something fun. This is just purely for fun. We're going to put some clouds in the sky. And I'm going to use the picket fence, which is the white picket fence, because we have some white splots in here that we picked up when we um, put the water on the page. So again, shake, shake the paint. And I'm going to put a little bit of the white picket fence out here on my craft mat, like that. And I'm going to use my fingers, and I'm going to. This is where you get to finger paint things. And so I'm going to show you about the finger painting. I'm going to give you a real close up here. So here are the pages, and I have my little blot of my little splot of white paint. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just use. I find my these two fingers in here, my ring finger and my uh, middle finger. Those are great fingers for doing finger painted clouds. So you just simply make fluffy dabs with your fingers. Fluffy tops, think in terms of horizontal shapes, not balls. 
of color, which is easy to come out with um, grade school kind of looking clouds. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you like, that is perfectly fine. I'm just telling you that this happens to be the kind of clouds that I like. And so I'll put another little cloud here. So kind of fluffy at the top, but thinking kind of horizontal shapes. I might see if I can get that one to sneak in, look like it's behind those roses just a little bit. And then maybe we'll just leave those three on there because we've got, well, let's put a little, see I tell you that and then I go, oh no, I can't do that. So we'll put a little bit more here, just a little bit, kind of running off the page. Okay, so there's another little fluffy cloud. So you just, it's just a matter of tap, tap, tap with your finger. So I pick it up with, by tapping and then I just tap in a shape. And if you need more paint, just squish a little bit more out on your craft mat. And this just adds another layer of visual texture to your page. So fluffy tops, kind of flat bottoms, kind of horizontal, those are all the things that I think about when I'm doing clouds. Let some hang off the page and you can even make some look like they're kind of sneaking in behind a rose. Okay, so we have some clouds in the sky. So there are our little clouds. Now to make them show up even a little bit better, I put a little bit more white on my mat, like that. I put a tea tiny little bit of blue. Okay, tea tiny, and even less black. Tiny, 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 little tiny bit of black. And then with my finger again, I'm going to blend and make a gray. See how powerful that black stains that. So I'm going to wipe my finger and come back and pick up mostly white and mix into that because I want this just a really soft gray color and it, I don't have to have it totally mixed. So you can see it's just kind of an off white leaning toward gray. And I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to put just a tiny bit. And this is where I use one finger to put on paint and another one to blend. And if you need to, pick up some white. But you can see how it has just a little bit of um, shading in that cloud. So we'll go to the next one here. And all you need to do is go out and look at clouds. And you'll see how many colors there are in clouds and how individual they look, which is another cool thing about clouds. So very little paint on my finger. And come back with white and you can kind of blend over those just a little bit with your finger. So I'm just finger painting and patting the color on to get some color into those clouds. So we'll go over here on this one, put a little color because you can't really do it to one and not the other. And as your paints get a little drier, as the paints get a little bit drier, they will kind of blend for you. You don't have to work as hard. But because this distress paint is a little bit slower to dry, you could never do this this way. You would have to employ water to do this with regular craft paints. But you can do this with the um, distress paints because they stay wet a little bit longer, which is 
exactly why I like them. So there you have your um, clouds, some clouds in the sky, just again a little bit of something something extra and a little bit of shading to kind of shading gives them some dimension and also helps them show up against the sky a little bit. Okay. All right. Now let me clean up this mess so I don't put my hand in it. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add some stems onto the page. So what we're going to do at this point is we're going to concentrate on this page, on the right page. So what I do to this page, I would do, what I do to the right page, I would also do to the left page. But for now, I'm just going to switch and just work on the right page. So I'm going to take some stem material, and this is my stem material. Remember, I cut those out. And I'm going to kind of give myself some stems. I just kind of lay them out, and I just tear them. So lay them out to start with, and you can decide how you want those stems to go. So you can see I'm just laying them out. And one that is thinner or that is further away back here, for example, what I'm going to do with that one is and it kind of looks, I have a couple of choices. I can either let the stem come down like this, and I could have the stem come over the rose that's down here on the bottom. Or what I would prefer to do is, let's see if we can do this. Uh, now I'll trim that up a little bit when I get there, when I start gluing down. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to add the rest of the stem on either side of this rose. So that way, it's going to look like it goes behind, okay? And let's see, let's go with this one. So same kind of thing on this rose. Um, I can either have the stem behind or on top of this. I prefer to have it behind. So we're going to do like that. And then come down here like that and then because this is a bigger rose I'm going to look for a fatter piece of paper and this one has a little bit of curve to it you see it has, it has kind of a curve and this piece this stem has a curve so I'm going to use that one right there okay so I've laid out my stems Let's see if I can show them to you So I've laid out the way that I'm going to have the stems be on this page. Okay, so I've just kind of laid it out. And now I'm going to use my quick dry, Scotch quick dry glue. And I'm going to glue these down. And the reason I use the Scotch quick dry glue is because, in fact, it does dry quickly. You don't have much time to work with it before it grabs the paper. Okay, and on this rose that's up here at the top that has the stem coming behind it, so on this rose right here where the stem is going to go behind the one in front of it, I'm going to start at the top, and I'm going to let that stem for a minute just kind of hang out over that rose. Now I've not glued it down over that rose, I'm just going to let it hang out there though. And then I, it can give me a visual of where that would continue if it were on top here, so I'm going to continually continue that stem in a visual way and I'm going to put some glue down here and I'm going to do the same thing I'm going to let it stick up into that rose and I'm going to let that glue set up okay just let the glue set up 
and then I'll come back and I'll trim those off. Okay, so we're going to go this one next. And this one is going to come. So I'm going to make my line of glue. And it's going to stick up inside that that rose blossom just a little bit also. And I'm going to make sure that it isn't stuck down totally tight right up here. So there's a little bit of looseness up here. See? And I'll show you what I'm going to do with that in a minute. And as you get more glue on your fingers, things will start trying to pick up and move. Okay, so we got that one, and we got one more. And that's this one right up here. So again, I'm gonna put the stem and let it kinda hang down into that rose, although it's not glued into it, it's just kinda overlapping it. right there. And then that gives me a chance to visually look at, okay, how is that stem going to come? It would come down here and it would be about right here. And put the rest of your stem on. Okay making sure it's not glued down on top of the rows. Okay, now all these little ragtag things that I've left up, sticking up like this, that gives me a chance now to be able to go in here with my scissors, and this is picky, I realize that, I recognize that. But I can come in here and I can follow the contour of that petal of the rose up here. So I can follow the contour of it and clip it off. And then I can come down here at the bottom of this one and I can follow the contour of that one. And put it down. So now you see that it has the appearance that the stem comes down and continues on down here. And then that will even look more that way once I do the pen work on it. So you can get really picky about this to get those little stems to fit exactly in the little nooks and crannies that you want them to fit in, in those little petals. And sometimes even when they're glued down, you can pick at the, the stem just a little bit and you can come in and you can clip off to get, to get it to be exactly the way you want it to be. Okay, so there you go. So here's what we have so far with our stems. Then all this little ragtag stuff on the bottom, you just turn it over and you just use your scissors and you just cut them off. And that's how you get it to be even with the bottom of your page without having to try and cut and measure and match and do all that silliness. Okay, so there you go. Now, so you can imagine the same, you can see what a difference having the stems makes now with your roses. Begins to really have a cool look, doesn't it? Then that little container of leaves that you have, <clears throat> this is where you just start playing. So I just, I literally pull, it, pull out a leaf. I stick a little Scotch Quick Dry on the back. Not a lot, because you don't want it to be uh, too soupy. The, the Scotch Quick Dry is a pretty liquidy glue and so you don't want it to be uber, uber liquidy because it will start really oozing out. 
behind the leaves and so I don't like it to do that. So then I just start putting leaves on my roses and this is again where I let things stick off the bottom and I am not trying to um, make these botanically correct. I'm just putting leaves on my roses. Now I put the larger leaves at the bottom and the tinier leaves up at the top of the page. And if some of the leaves stick over another stem, that's even better. So I literally just stick them down and this is where you just get to play and if you don't get enough adhesive put it, just lift it up and put a little bit more on and I wipe off any of the excess. So let's go, let me go up here and use some of the smaller leaves and just kind of show you what I do. I let some of them stick on top of the stem and some of them act as though they were coming maybe from behind the stem. <clears throat> and if you have some teensy tiny little guys, which when you get going crazy, you might have some little tiny, tiny ones, then you can always put those up here by the rose uh, blossom itself. And that that's a really fun look too. And then you just simply put, continue putting the leaves on your roses any way that you wish. And then when you're finished and they're dry, you want them to be dry, then I would come in from behind just like I did on the leaves and I would cut those off. I'm just gonna bend them under just for the purposes of showing you what I would do, how it would look. But see, they would just be bent, um, cut off the bottom of the page. So it look, has the effect that you have a rose garden growing from the bottom of your page. And you don't really know where they start. And you don't really know where the, the soil is because that's not the point. And that is how you grow your rose garden. So there you go with your roses and your clouds and your beautiful distress paint sky in the background and so forth. Okay, so you just keep going. You just keep playing with your roses. All right, so we've done all of that. Now this has to be really dry for, for the next part to work. And so we're gonna hit it with a heat gun and see if we can force it to get dry. This would be better if you let this sit and totally, totally dry. But we're gonna see if we can get it, force it to dry a little bit. See if we can get this glue to cooperate with us. So I can show you the pen work. Because it's kind of fun to see what it does. How you do it. You'll see that there's a little bit of outline sometimes when right in here you can see some dark stuff that doesn't completely cut off maybe when you cut out the napkin and so this is kind of a fun thing that makes all of that just completely disappear. Okay, we'll see. It might be dry enough. We'll hope. Okay, this is your jelly roll pin and this is the black jelly roll pin and this is what is just it, this is just fun to do. And so I take the pin and I start outlining things. And so I outline the stuff that's the furthest back. Well, the furthest back in this case would be the stems. So let's see if we can get this to work on here. And I do this kind of hit and miss. I don't intend for it to be a solid line. So hit and miss. And if I get up on top of the stem a little bit, that's okay. I'm not concerned about it. And I would do this once the, uh, everything was done, all the leaves were on and all the um, stems, of course, and everything. And then I come in and I do the same thing to the leaves because usually the leaves are on top of the stems or has that appearance. And so I would do that. So let's come over here and see if we can do this one.
but I am after a sketchy outline, not a um, perfect outline, just a little sketchy outline. And I'm using very light pressure with this pen. Then on the leaves, and you can see some of the places, I'm not even right up next to the leaf, and I like that. I like that look also. Let me uh, go ahead and do this one. Okay, then I put in some of the veining from the leaves. Very light. This is where it's kind of like the doodle process. And if you let your veins kind of curl a little bit, it gives some movement to the leaf can give the leaf the impression that it is uh, bending and curling a little bit. So there's some of your pen work. Now there'd be more pen work because you'd have more leaves on it, but you can see how cool that one looks. Then I come in with the rose, and I, because the rose is on top of the stem, and then I just go around the rose, just the outside. And I kind of give it a little bit of a fluffy, fluffier edge and what that does is take that it distracts your eye right away from any dark outline that might have been there and then it's going to take this rose which is so pale and it's going to bring it to the foreground and pop it forward so you can see it so we'll do this one too now, this rose petal, the way I've put the leaf on it, the leaf is on top of the rose, so I'm going to start the outline at the edge of that leaf. Like so. Okay, like so. All right, and then I like to put some little birds in the sky. And the birds are simply a little um, kind of a V shape. And this is just a suggestion of a bird. So there's my bird, it's just a V shape. And so by angling the V shapes different directions and making them different sizes, you can get the impression of birds flying from different directions and different um, distances off in the sky. And I usually put them together in sets of three. Because I just think that they look kind of cool. And then I'll do odd groupings. So instead of two, two groups of three, I'll do another one here. So those are really off in the distance. Okay, so there you have some birds. Then when you're all finished, uh, I would put a quote on it, put some words on it, or title your page somehow if you wish. And the very last thing, and I'll show you the, the um, how I did that on the finished page over here in just a second. I go back to the black soot distress paint and I'm going to edge my page. Now I'm going to leave the part in the middle alone because that's going to be connected because there's a flower in the middle. I don't want to cut the flower off. And if this gets a little um, sloppy down here, I, I'm fine with that. I actually like that sort of look of, of things not being perfect. And that just helps frame your page. 
Now that paint does stay wet for a little bit, so. Okay, so the one on the right has the black edge around it. The one on the left, you can see what a difference there is on that. By not having the edging around it, there's no frame around it yet. And the one on my left, of course it doesn't have stems or anything else. But there is your completed um, page aside from needing to have the quotes. That's all the, the processes with using the distress paints. So let me show you the finished, finished page. So we'll just set that aside. So this is the, the uh, finished, finished page. Again, I'm working in on here. In um, this particular journal is the composition journal. And so here is, let me just move all this jazz out of the way so you can really see. Okay, here we go. So now you can see what it looks like when it's all completely finished. Now this is a composition journal, so it's a different paper. Um, and what's nice about this particular paper when I was working with it is because it's a composition notebook, you can still see some of the lines back here. And so on the lines, that gave me a perfect place to write my the quote that I used, which was, every flower is a soul blossoming in nature. <clears throat> and I wrote that quote using the pit um, black pen because it is a matte finish and it will write over the acrylic paint back here and it works very well and you can see um, you can see that for the eyes for um, the letter I for the dot I just drew a little flower shape and I did a very sketchy look with uh, my own handwriting I didn't print it out I just wrote in my own handwriting kind of goofy handwriting just on purpose so it would kind of sketchy be sketchy and go with the rest of the page so that is what I did. So what you see in the background is exactly the same background we did with the Distress Paint. So this one is on the mixed media paper. This one is on Composition Notebook. So it has lined paper in the back. But other than that, it was exactly the same. It had the wood icing, the gesso, the Distress Paints, the flicked water, which you can see all the spottiness in the back, the flicked water, and then dab up the paint. Um, it has the, the napkin images exactly the way I showed you. It has the stems and leaves exactly the way I showed you. It's outlined with the jelly roll, the black jelly roll pen to add some character in the leaves and the stems and around the flowers. It has the little tiny birds up here in the sky. The page is edged with the black soot. You can see the black soot. And the quote is put on with the black pit pen. And then in the, the um, center here, I stamped my date that I did this particular page. So there you go. Class ran a little bit long. I try to keep them a little bit shorter than this, so you got, you got some bonus stuff today. I hope you've enjoyed the class. Um, I really appreciate you coming and spending time with me. And hopefully you've learned some stuff about distress paints and uh, another way to kind of express yourself with art journaling. Sometimes you don't have to get craziness out of your head. You can just play with the paints, play with the, the art supplies just to see what they do. And that's what this, this um, today was all about. So I hope you've enjoyed the class. And if you have, I hope you tell a friend. Look for the class notes. Send me an email if you have a question. And um, I will be back again soon for another class. And I'll see you then. Have a great super creative day. See you soon.